Good to be with you here in Collegedale, Tennessee. It's a beautiful part of the country. It's a humid part of the country. <laughs> it's a little bit more dry out our way. I'm delighted to be here this evening. I want to thank my friend, your president, Ed Wright. I have a great deal of affection, appreciation, and respect for Ed. I've known him for quite a number of years since he was pastoring the church here and I was pastoring in Loma Linda. We met together in a group every year for a period of time and I grew to deeply appreciate him. You have a very good conference president. So I delightedly accepted the invitation to come. Appreciate the hospitality I've already experienced, the invitation, the introduction rather by Rick Grieve. I'm always a little bit ill at ease during an introduction because I don't know what anybody, what the person's going to say. I was at a camp meeting where a gentleman got up and introduced me and said, my son lives in Loma Linda and tells me that he plays basketball with Randy every week. My son tells me Randy is a very good speaker. <laughs> I'm never quite sure what people are going to say. But I feel warmly welcomed and I'm pleased to be here. Just backstage where Rick and I met, we go way back there, I, I saw someone else. Gentleman who is seated somewhere here, Mr. Holdridge is how I used to know him. Where are Right down here on the front row, very good. Came up to me and greeted me and I looked at him and thought, I know this person. And I was right. <laughs> you are who I thought you were. That's a little bit risky. I will meet some of you, have the privilege of making a reacquaintance sometime during the next few days. And no question, I will struggle just a bit to know exactly a name and put the name in a context. It was like what happened to me at Sligo Church years ago. I was visiting Sligo with a friend of mine. He and I were traveling the eastern seaboard during a summer break from seminary. We went to Sligo Church that Sabbath, and we didn't know anybody. Set through the worship service, enjoyed the service. But we thought, well, there's no one here that we know. We didn't know what we were going to do for lunch afterwards. We were standing out of the lobby while everybody was milling about. When suddenly, out of the crowd, a young woman rushed up to me, threw her arms around me, and just squealed with delight. She said, John, it's so good to see you. My name is Randy. <laughs> so I squeezed her back and said, it's good to see you too. <laughs> she grabbed me by the hand and pulled me over to her husband and began a flowery description of my brother, John. And she said to her husband, honey, you've just got to meet this guy. You've just got to get to know him. And I thought, yeah, you really do. <laughs> you really should. It's a little bit unnerving. But we'll have a good time together. And if I miss a name, if I miss a context, I trust that you will have the grace of Jesus to forgive that as we reacquaint ourselves with one another and as I meet many new friends. More like him is the theme of your camp meeting. More like him. We're going to spend tonight and the next three nights beyond that and Sabbath morning, looking at passages of Scripture, mostly in the New Testament, but one in the Old, that may give us an insight, open a window, open a door into that discipleship journey which we walk as we become more like Him. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, what a delight it is to be together with friends, some old friends, some new acquaintances, some friends yet to be known, drawn together, bonded together by this one desire to be more like Him. Lord, as we come to Your Word this evening and each time we're together, might Your Spirit rest upon us, open the Word to us, give us insight into Your character, and transform us so that when we leave this place, we might leave more like Him. In Jesus' name, amen. 
I'd like to take you to a passage of Scripture in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 8. Admittedly, it's a bit of an unusual passage. An unusual passage with which not just to begin a camp meeting series, but to preach on at any time. It's one of those passages in the, in the Gospels, one of the passages describing the ministry of Jesus that may cause you to shake your head, to scratch your head, and to wonder exactly what does that mean? What does that have to do with my discipleship journey, with becoming more like Him? In fact, I venture to guess that if we were to go person by person, row by row, section by section this evening, asking every individual here, what is your favorite passage of Scripture? Not a one of you would name this one. I venture that guess. And yet that's where we begin this evening. It's Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8, beginning with verse 18. It says this, When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and bird ha birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Chances are you haven't lingered long over that passage, thinking, I love the sound of the words, I love the images that arise in my mind, I love the story that appears in this passage. Chances are most of us have spent very little time with it. So when it comes to looking at a passage like this, trying to understand how it might intersect with our lives, we have to slow down and ask, what exactly is unfolding here? There's something I often do when I study a passage of Scripture to try to, to help me get a sense of what's going on. And that is, after spending some prayerful time looking at the passage, reading it through, studying it, I start to ask myself, is there a word, maybe just a word, that would adequately or aptly describe the theme of the passage? It helps me focus my thoughts. And I did that with this passage. After spending some time reading it and considering what was therein contained, I thought, what is the word that describes it? And I'll be honest with you, the first word I came up with wasn't a particularly positive word. It was the word rude. Rude. Come on, be honest. When you read the story, you have two individuals that come up to Jesus, the teacher, the itinerant rabbi, who has been walking the countryside, inviting people to follow him, urging them to take up the cross and walk with him, urging him to be, them to become a part of his cadre of followers. And then two come. And he, in essence, says, don't bother. And it just seems rude. Please understand, by that I mean no disrespect. I'm just trying to be honest to the text. In fact, I have a memory. It happened in Granbury, Texas. First church district I pastored out of college. Granbury was one of the two churches, Weatherford being the other. We had a Revelation seminar that we've sponsored at the Granbury Church. A woman came to the seminar who had had a bit of a love-hate relationship with Scripture. She had studied it much, had sought to come closer to God, but then would be pushed away and couldn't make a commitment. I remember going to visit her one day. She lived in a house right on the lake, a quaint community. There, that house was perched on the edge of the lake, a beautiful vista spread out before her. I remember exactly where we stood. We were standing in her driveway. The, the wind was blowing briskly. The water looked beautiful. And I asked her, 
don't you want to commit your life to following Jesus? And she said to me, no, I just can't do it. And I said, Ken, I, I'm curious why. Why is it that you can't find it in your heart to make a commitment to follow him? Do you know what she said to me? She said, I cannot follow a Jesus who would do that. And she pointed specifically to this passage. I just can't see myself following a Lord who would say to somebody, let the dead bury their own dead when the man wants to attend his father's, father's funeral. I can't do it. And this is the passage she quoted. Rude. Now, I might stay with that word except for the fact that I've spent a lot of time in the gospel accounts. Far beyond just this passage in Matthew 8. All throughout the gospel of Matthew as well as Mark, Luke, and John. I've spent a great deal of my life studying those gospels. And the word rude just doesn't fit with the Jesus that emerges from the entire narrative of the Gospels. When I look at the overall picture, that word doesn't fit. So even though I have questions about it here, I had to go back and look again. I spent some more time with the passage trying to sort out what is the word that would, that would speak of this reality. A second one emerged. I'll admit, not much better. The word was selfish. Selfish. Haven't we all known leaders like that? Don't start naming names. Leaders where it's all about me, it happens on either side of the aisle, it happens in every business, it happens in every social context, there's a leader, and you think as you watch, as you listen to what the leader shares, this is all about her, this is all about him. Selfish. And when I first read this passage and began to spend time with it and saw what Jesus was saying here, I had a question about that. Is that what's happening here? Certainly his followers have done that at times. I remember an acquaintance who told me a story of his ministry experience. A reasonably young pastor had a leader come to his church to hold an evangelistic series. You know what those used to be like, not so much anymore. Night after night and week after week. He said, when we weren't in meetings, we were visiting. When we weren't visiting, we were planning. When we weren't planning, we were praying. When we weren't praying, we were preparing. It was nonstop from beginning to end. We were getting toward the end of the meetings, and it was a Sunday morning. And my wife and kids had had enough. They said, that's enough. You've got to have a day off. You know, we're your family too. And he apparently said, I know, I know, but, but this gentleman, this preacher, this evangelist, he, he wants me to go visiting again today. But we need you. There were tears and entreaties and then a horn honking in the driveway. He went out wondering, what am I going to do? Sat down in the front seat and said to the visiting evangelist, I'm sorry, I, I cannot go today. My wife, my kids, we need time, can't do it. And the evangelist quoted him this passage. And said, there are times when you have to follow. Leave the other behind. And with pain in his voice, this gentleman said, and so I did. Left my family that day. Quite a number of years later, I ran into his wife visiting our church out my way. Many years had passed since we had seen each other. It's good to see you. 
How are you? How is your husband? Well, we divorced some years ago. Shouldn't have surprised me, but it saddened me. And I thought of this text and the use of this text in the car that Sunday morning. And I wonder, is that the word? Selfish. But again, I read the Gospels. I read statements like, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give His life as a ransom for many. I read of accounts where he was buffeted and battered and bloodied and said in his prayer, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And I think that can't be the word. And so I kept looking. After a while, I came up with a third word. It's not a lot better, but it's a third word. And it was the word extreme. Extreme. We live in a day and age of extremes. Have you noticed that? Turn on ESPN and you find extreme sports. You find people running races 24 hours long, 100 miles in distance, climbing mountains just because they're there. You find them doing extreme kinds of things. But it is not just in the sports world. Just sit down some time with your computer and type into the Google bar extreme religion and see what comes up. Some of the names you will know, you will recognize, and often you recognize them because of the sad end to which they and their followers came. And if you begin to peruse the pages, and especially if you begin to read in the fine print, you discover that one of the qualities, one of the characteristics that these leaders, one after another, have is they begin to demand that their followers cut everybody else off. You can't have family. You can't have friends. You've got to give your money to me. Cut everyone else off. It's just about us. It's us against the world. You know the world out there is out to get you. I am the one who can save you. Extreme religion. Summarily unhealthy. Damaging. I did wonder that about this passage. (laughs) But then I remembered other stories. Stories about people who had been pushed to the fringes, drawn into the circle of God's love. Stories of people like a little bad man named Zacchaeus, who knew what it was to be spurned, but also experienced what it was like to look down, have Jesus look up and say to him, Zacchaeus, guess who's coming to dinner at your house today? And I thought, that can't be the word. So I did something that is always wise to do. I begin to look at the context. Begin to look around at what was happening in the Gospel of Matthew during this period of time. And as I did so, I noticed a word that began to, that that, that appeared, began to appear back in Matthew 4, and it appeared several times up to this story. Matthew 4, 25, it appeared. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Large crowds. Next chapter, 5, 1. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them what we know as the Sermon on the Mount crowds. No sooner does he offer the benediction for the sermon 
Matthew 7, then these words, when Jesus had finished these sayings, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Matthew 8, the beginning of our chapter. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. Even when we come to the first verse in our passage, verse 18, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to go to the other side of the lake. Over and over again, in this context of Matthew, crowds, 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 large crowds, to the point where Jesus is trying to get away from the crowds. His ministry is having an electric effect on ancient Palestine. The news has spread like wildfire. Lives are being changed. Something amazing is happening. Could God have visited His people? And the people flock to Him. It always happens, doesn't it? When something big, something important happens, everybody wants to be in on it. Everybody wants to see. It might even just be driving down the road. As I was the other day in Southern California, I was on the highway along with every other person in Southern California, and we were snarled in traffic, just stopped. What's happened? It's the middle of the day edging our way, inching our way. And finally, an accident. Not even a serious accident. Off to the side, not in the road. Soon as we passed it, shoom, off we went. Just everybody had to see. Everybody had to slow down. Daddy, look. It's the way we are. Something happens, we all run. Somebody appears, we all want to get a glimpse. Somebody famous, wow. Back in my days in school, college at Keene, a group of us used to go up to, in that day and time, it was Texas Stadium where the Cowboys played. We had learned that, that if you went, even if you didn't have a ticket, you could buy tickets outside from people who were selling them. You just waited until about game time. The first cheer that went up, the prices dropped. And even we college students could afford them. But we had gone to a game that day. Game was over. We were exiting the stadium with all the other people. We had hung around a bit to the very end. So there was a bit of openness in the crowd. And suddenly, down the stairs ahead of us, we saw another crowd surrounding somebody all crowded around this person, and it was moving like a miniature Moses and Israel from the Egypt to the Promised Land, moving from the stadium out to a large limousine parked waiting. Well, we were curious, like anyone else. So we ran. We wanted to see who is this, what's the crowd, what is the object of everyone's attention and focus. Finally, as it got close to the limousine, somehow it opened up. And right there we saw him. Some of you will remember him. In all of his glory, Mr. T. Long fur coat. More gold than I had ever seen. You remember the haircut. Striding with pride to the limo. And we were all watching. We wanted to see. Crowd. That's what's happening in Jesus' ministry. As lives are being changed, as people's destinies are being transformed, as bodies are being healed, people come. His ministry is soaring in popularity. The best church in town, the latest program, everybody's coming. So it's no surprise when two come. I want to be a part of it. 
Jesus, I want to be, I just, I got to run home and, and, and take care of some family business, but I want to be on board. Count me in. And then Jesus makes his statement. Foxes have dens and birds have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And somehow arising out of that comes our word. I think it's the word. The word that helps us to focus on what the meaning of the passage for us is. The word is commitment. Commitment. Maybe you want to say it a bit differently. Maybe you want to say it like this. Jesus, in what he says to these two would-be disciples, is essentially saying this, friends, I am not looking for fair-weather friends. Everything is coming up roses right now. Everybody's excited. All the world wants to be on board. But make no mistake about it. I am not looking for fair weather friends. I am looking for commitment. I have nothing to offer you. No house, no bedroom, no pillow. You might want to count the cost before you get on the train. Make certain you know the destination before you punch your ticket. Because I'm looking for commitment. Now somehow that makes sense to me. Because I understand that Jesus is not the only one who understands commitment. I've read of it, you've read of it in other places as well. I've read of it in the, in the life, in the annals of Julius Caesar, who is said to have, when he arrived in the British Isles, marched his forces up above the white cliffs of Dover and stood them there along the cliffs to look back at the channel which they had just crossed and to see the ships on which they had just crossed burning in the harbor. Commitment. We're all in. There's no going back. I've read of it in the life of that great missionary David Livingston who sought unsuccessfully for a mission society that would sponsor him, that would say, we will give you the support required. No one wanted to sign on. And then he went into the heart of Africa and he began to share the love of Jesus with the people whom he encountered there. And as the stories began to filter back home, as they began to hear what was happening, now they wrote him eagerly, now we want to be on board. Can, can, can you send us a map? Show us the road to where you are. We have others, others who want to follow. To which Livingston is said to have written back and said, I am not looking for people who need to know where the road is. I am looking for people who make their own road. That's the word commitment. Or the singer. Listen to these words. When I was a boy, my father, a baker, Introduce me to the wonders of song. He urged me to work very hard to develop my voice. A professional singer in my hometown took me as a pupil. But I also enrolled in a teacher's college. On graduating, I asked my father, shall I be a singer or a teacher? Son, my father replied, if you try to sit on two chairs, you will fall between them. For life, you must choose 
one chair. I chose one. It took seven years of study and frustration before I made my first professional appearance. It took another seven years to reach the Metropolitan Opera. And now I think whether it's laying bricks, writing a book, whatever we choose, we should give ourselves to it. Commitment. That's the key. Choose one chair. Luciano Pavarotti. Commitment. That's the key. Jesus says, I'm not looking for fair weather friends. Now, you may still be troubled, and you have a right to be, especially about the second disciple. I just want to go attend my dad's funeral. Maybe a bit of context in the world of that day and time will help almost certainly what was happening here. The burial of a loved one happened in two stages. First of all, in ancient Judaism, and in many cases in modern-day Orthodox Judaism, when a person dies, they must be buried before the sun sets. There was that initial burial. But then a long period, typically at least a year's time, would pass until the body was decayed enough that the bones could be gathered, and then the bones were buried in the family plot, we would call it, many, many months later. It is almost certainly that to which the man is referring. Jesus, uh, my, my father has died. Had he died, in accordance with the customs of the day, he would have been almost immediately buried. He could not have been referring to that. What he apparently was saying was, Jesus, I want to be on board, but I've got this commitment. It's going to take a while. It'll be a month or two, three, six, eight, twelve months. It's going to be a while. But would you put a, 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 my name on a chair there, put reserved? Because I'm coming back one of these days. Because I want to be on board. And Jesus says, commitment. That's the key. That's the word. We don't hear much about it these days. These days when we want to put on the best PR campaign possible. We want to put a happy face on religion. We want to make sure everybody knows the benefits. I understand. But we're in peril if we don't also say foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Commitment. Jesus is not looking for fair weather friends. The story of that day doesn't end there. Back to Matthew 8. Right on the heels of our text, as the words of Jesus to the man still hang in the air, Matthew records these words. Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He said, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up, rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. It would have been a frightening experience. Remember, some of these were men who had grown up on that lake. Grown up there, spent their lives as fishermen on the lake, spent many a night on the lake, and no doubt had ridden out many a storm. We had the privilege of being at that place. 
We were up a bit away from the lake, up on what is called the Mount of Beatitudes, where it is believed Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. And the wind was whipping around us, roaring down onto the lake, stirring it up. As historians say, often happened historically. They had ridden out many a storm. And yet this one sweeps in upon them and frightens them to their very core. Why? Was it worse than any other? Maybe so. If you read parallel passages in Mark, however, you discover that they had apparently forgotten that Jesus was on board. Desire of ages, a line, caught up in their efforts to save themselves, they had forgotten Jesus was on board. You know what that's like. When the storms of life sweep into your home, Shaking everything that can be shaken. When you sit in a doctor's office and the doctor says, I'm sorry to tell you. And you can see it in her eyes. She doesn't even have to mouth the word and you already know. The future is compromised. A storm has hit. When you get home and the house is silent, the other car is gone. A note is on the refrigerator and you realize he's gone. When the phone shrieks in the stillness of 1 a.m., you know it's not. It's not good. Is this Mr. Jones? Father of Pat Jones? And the storm erupts. Do you know what happens to most of us at that moment? We forget Jesus is on board. We we think that Jesus is a fair weather friend. That he's only there when the sun shines. But not when the wind blows, when the lightning flashes, when the thunder rolls, when the waves crash over our boat and threaten to engulf it. Where is he now? And Jesus says, I am not a fair weather friend. I am with you when the sun shines. And I am with you when the darkness is palpable. I am not a fair weather friend. That realization has allowed me to sit, sit with a couple in a hospital room in Loma Linda, California. She, her body so broken, that there were pulleys and weights holding her together. The man who had taken a drink and then taken a drive, who had careened into her car, killing their only child and destroying her body. I could almost hear the storm as they asked, where is Jesus. I said it very carefully because I've never been in that boat. But before the conversation ended, I wanted them to know he's not a fair weather friend. Somewhere, I don't know where, Somewhere he's in this boat. I sat with a couple. As he said to her, it's over. There's someone else. 
when we leave this office, I'm not going home. I'm going home with her. And I watched her dissolve. I watched her almost slip into tiny rivers of tears flowing out of my office. But the kids, he left, didn't want to hear it. Somewhere in the days and weeks to come, slowly, carefully, hopefully, respectfully, I said to her, Jesus is not a fair-weather friend. He's there somewhere in your boat. I have experienced it in my own life. Those dark nights of the soul. Within the last year, many early mornings, three, four in the morning, pacing the streets of Redlands, California, just saying, Jesus, just show us where you are. We want to follow you. We want to work through the realities that are crushing us right now. Slowly but surely, through the whistling wind and the turbulent sea, I realized he's not a fair weather friend. Commitment, that's the key. Do you want to know about his commitment? Then go to a place called Calvary, where on Calvary you find him suspended between earth and sky, because earth did not want him and heaven could not claim him. You find him there suspended, crying out in agony, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you want a one-word summary of that cry, it is commitment. It is Jesus saying, I will go as far as I have to go and further, just so you know that I am not a fair-weather friend. And it is because of that that Jesus can look at us and he can say to us, I'm not looking for fair weather friends. Just as I have committed myself to you, just as I will go to Calvary and back for you, I just want to know that you'll commit to me. We don't often study that passage. We don't often linger there. And even when we do, we can sometimes misunderstand. I don't know what it would be for you. But I know for me, If you were to ask me, what is your one word summary? Of both of those stories, I would say commitment. Jesus is not looking for fair weather friends because Jesus is not a fair weather friend. Gracious God, we are so deeply thankful to serve a Savior who loves us with an everlasting love. Lord, our hearts are feeble and faltering and failing. Commitment scares us. We live in a commitment-phobic society. It's so scary to commit. But somehow, even through our sometimes doubt-ridden, sin-clouded minds, even we understand 
that in commitment comes true happiness. So Lord, give us the courage to commit. I just want to give you a chance in the stillness of your own soul, in the quietness of your own heart, to respond to Jesus, not just because it's popular, not just because there's a crowd, but to respond to Him because you're willing to get into that boat and face the storm with Him. Lord, you've heard our prayers. You've heard our decisions. Now grip us with your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.